We're on a series on spiritual warfare. Again, I cannot reiterate to you how important I feel this series is, how important I feel the information is. Uh, I recognize that probably many of you are in the middle of a battle right now in the course of your life. And we want to be equipped and qualified to fight and war properly. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20 are the verses that the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and tells them how to equip themselves to do battle. They, they incorporated in, into their lives and they became a mighty church. They conquered and defeated the enemy on many occasions. And again, I cannot tell you how important I feel this is. In my own personal life, this is one of those sections of scripture that transformed my thinking and transformed my life, changed the way I dealt with circumstances that I faced. I don't know how to make, tell you how important it is. Some of this will be stuff that some of you have heard already, but I'm here to tell you that it's important that you'll hear me over the course of my pastorate at this church hammering away at these truths that we're going to talk about tonight and during the course of this series because I know them to be truth, and I know they to be revelatory, and I know, they to be, I know them to be principles that will change and transform your life. And I just want, with everything that's in me, challenge you today to get a hold of these things and apply them to your life. Ephesians 6, are y'all there? Finally, verse 10, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We've already talked about that. Let me rehearse in just a few seconds the fact that we've got to put on the whole arm of God. Putting on means that every day you've got to get up and get dressed with it. Nobody can put it on you. Nobody can make you, can smear it on you. Nobody can lay their hands on you and it's on you all the time. Every day you got to get up. You got to get up and say, I got to put the armor on. I got to get dressed. Put it on on a daily basis, day by day. How many of y'all know sometimes you get up and you don't put it on and you go out undressed and the devil whips your behind? Anybody know what I'm talking about? He runs you up and down the course. He kicks your butt and you say, Lord, let this day hurry up and get over. But if we get smart and mature enough, we recognize that before I walk out the door, I need to go ahead and get dressed with the whole arm of God. We got to put it on because the devil is full of tricks. He said, that, he said, I want you to put on the whole armor that you can stand against the tricks of the devil, the wiles, the schemes, the plots of the devil. Then he says, verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Your problem is not your husband, it's not your wife, it's not your kids, it's not your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your boss, your co-worker, your ministry head. It's not flesh and blood that we're wrestling against. We are wrestling against spiritual entities. And I know we don't like to talk about this because people think you're being spooky and all of that. But the reality of the fact is we are facing and are being challenged by spiritual entities that go beyond what can be seen with the natural eye. And he tells us in verse number 12 who they are. We are wrestling against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual weakness in high places. And let me hit those real quick. Um, our battle is fourfold. Number one is against principalities. Demons are ranked. We got to learn to stop wrestling with the lower level demons and get to the head jokers. Number two, powers. The devil has powers. We're not going to get tricked or deceived because the devil, through a Ouija board, through looking at a crystal ball, through flipping cards, through going to somebody who reads your, the, 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 the marks in your hand, going to tell you something that don't nobody else know but you. We're not going to get tricked by them talking to your cousin who died 10 years ago. That's demonic. Somebody say, that's demonic. The devil has powers. Don't get impressed by power. Long since I've not gotten impressed by people who seem to demonstrate and flow in gifts. I want to know what kind of character you have. That's the real mark of whether you have Jesus in your life is do you have character. Number three is rulers of darkness. The devil runs and operates in darkness. That's his plan, his plot. He's a master at secrets and deceptions. He operates in that arena. That is his domain. He, it is his arena to operate in deceit, tricking, making you think something is one way when really it's the other way, ignorance, lies, schemes. He is the ruler of darkness. Finally, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, demonic plots. There are plots and schemes right now that the devil is scheming and putting together to orchestrate, to deceive you and get you off track. It doesn't happen by coincidence. He's worked it out 
because he know what you like. How many of y'all know the devil don't tempt you with stuff you don't like? Y'all understand what I'm saying? He don't mess with you in the arenas that he knows you're not tempted by. The devil can put liquor and alcohol and drugs in front of me all day long. It's not going to bother me. So guess what? He don't tempt me in those areas. He don't tempt you in areas that he know you don't have no problem with. But he know just what you like. Come on, talk to me for a second. He know just the kind of joker that's going to get your eye. Come on, talk to me for just a second. He knows exactly what gets your heart to pumping. And guess what? He brings that walking down the aisle. Come on, y'all, talk to me for just a second. He brings that up in your face. And he's plotted and schemed to bring it about. Because that's what he is. He has, he has demonic plots, and the ultimate end of those plots is your destruction. The ultimate end is to get you off track, to get you to miss the mark, get pulled away from your walk with Christ, to get you on a path that is the opposite of what God wants for your life. Do I have an amen anywhere in the camp? And so, and so that's verse 12. Therefore, verse 13, take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Let me talk about this evil day for just a moment. 30 seconds, I want to talk about the evil day. When it says that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, the evil day is the day, here's what that means, it is the day when the, ev when the devil unloads and aims all his guns at you and brings temptation and challenges and problems and issues at you all at one time. Anybody ever had your whole world seem to get turned upside down at one time? I mean, you get bad news from one call to the next, you get one issue after another, one call after another, one e letter after another, one email. He just aims all the guns at you all at one time. But here's what I discovered. God wants you to be able to stand, and not only to stand, but to withstand even when the devil has given all that he has against you. But here's what I'm celebrating. I'm praising the Lord that God is raising up some people in this church who've been in the word, rooted and grounded, they believe the word of God, they got faith, and the devil has aimed everything at them. He's thrown everything but the kitchen sink. He has lied on them. He has brought false accusations against them. He's caused them to get fired from their job. One spouse say, I don't want to be with you no more. Your children do all kind of bad. Your money look kind of funny. And we've got some people who say, now devil, if, that's the, if you thought that I was going to stop worshiping God after you did, is that the best? you got to come at me with I don't know who I don't know who you are but I know we got some people who are saying if that's all you got you're gonna have to come up with a whole lot more than that for me to stop worshiping the God the God I serve has been too good for me to stop worshiping him because of that kind of drama come on come on and practice with me say is that the best you got I'm gonna have to come up with a whole lot more than that for me to walk away and to quit than that. That, that I'm, I'm not only standing, I'm withstanding. Somebody say, I'm withstanding. High five your neighbor, say, I'm withstanding. When we get to verse 14, he starts rolling down. Here's what he says, verse 14. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, point one. He begins to go down through the pieces of armor. There's seven of them. We're going to try to get through all seven of them tonight. How many of y'all know we ain't going to get through all seven tonight? <laughs> y'all sound like y'all was, come on, Pastor, we can take all seven tonight. Can't get through all seven tonight. I'm going to try to get through two tonight. The first one right here is the belt of truth. Now, this is, I feel, it's the first one, and I think it's the most critical one. Why is it so critical? Because when a Roman soldier got dressed for battle, all of his other pieces of his weaponry attached to the belt. So if you don't have no belt, you can't put the other pieces on. You can't put all the pieces on. You can't put some of the other pieces on because everything else attaches to the belt. Everything else, most of the other pieces are connected to the belt in some way or the other. It's just, I don't know about y'all, but I, I feel, if I walk out the house without a belt on, I feel like my pants are going to fall down. Amen. Because, you know, I'm slim and trim. You know, I got it like that. I'm just, a, I'm just a slim and trim guy. 
pants. I got to have a belt on, even if my pants are tight, I got to have a belt on. I need a belt. I got to have a belt on because cause I got to put my, my, my I got to attach some stuff to it. I got to put my phone on my belt. Come on, talk to me. I, I, got, to, I got to have the belt. And you got to have the belt. And it's called the belt of truth. It's called the belt of truth. And in this piece called the belt of truth, he mentions, and I want to challenge you in what I believe are the are the key components of the belts of truth. Now, what, what, are, what is this belt of truth? Well, truth brings seven things associated. Number one, it, it is unconcealed reality. It's what's real and it's not hidden. It's unconcealed reality. It is the real thing that's not, that's not hidden. Now, here's the devil. He wants to hide stuff from you. He wants to hide truth from you. He wants to even, y'all ever met somebody who lives in something other than reality? Y'all ever met some folk? who live pretending and make believe and you know they think they something that they not y'all don't understand what I'm saying God, God wants you to live in reality he wants you to know who you are matter of fact I believe God wants you to see the drama that you're in you know some people say that the reason uh, Peter starts sinking when he got out of the boat and Jesus had come to me and he was walking on the water to go to Jesus and then he starts sinking some people say he starts sinking because he took his eyes off Jesus Matthew 14. Say he took his eyes off Jesus, he started sinking. I don't believe that's why he started sinking. He started sinking because he got afraid. But when people say he took his eyes off Jesus and that's what caused him to sink, implies that you're just supposed to keep your eyes focused on Jesus, don't see nothing else going on around you, just ignore the stuff that's going on around you. Ignore that your house is about to be foreclosed. Ignore that your children are going to hell. Ignore that your wife done filed for divorce. Ignore that they done fired you from your job. No, no. God wants you to see him and those things so that when you come up out of your situation, you have a testimony of what you came out of. I'm not saying focus on those things. Now, some folks focus on those stuff that they don't see Jesus. He wants you to see Jesus, but he also wants you to see what's going on in your life. Amen. He wants you to wake up and smell the coffee and see what's going on. And so truth is that you see who you are and what you're going through. Uncons truth is, you see that. Now, secondly, underneath, this is the absence of deceit. Truth means I'm no longer deceived. There's a lot of people who have been deceived, tricked, fooled. And truth means I'm, I'm, I'm delivered from deceit. The devil is victorious when he's capable of deceiving you. There's a lot of people who are in trouble because the devil has tricked them. It is, truth means it's the absence of deceit. Number three, listen to this. Truth means that there are declared absolutes. Now, what does that mean, declared absolutes? It means that God does have some absolute truths. Now, if you listen to the world, the world doesn't have absolute truths. They have situational ethics. Truth is determined by situations based on what the circumstances are. So if the circumstances call for a certain thing, then that situation calls for truth. No, 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 no. God has absolute truths, period. They, they are non-compromising. They're not up for debate. They're truths. And what I want to do tonight is reiterate to some and teach others, refocus, hammering again what those absolute truths are. If y'all get these seven truths down, if you could learn these seven truths, if you could walk and govern your lives by this, these seven truths, you can make a whole lot of difference in your life. Somebody say amen. amen. I want you to get these seven. I want you to learn them. I want you to know them frontwards and backwards, or up and down. Now, before I get there, I'm running ahead of myself. I'm so excited. Let me give you some truth, scriptures about truth. John 1.14 says this, that Jesus brought truth. He brought grace and truth. We got truth from Jesus. He brought it. Important thing to understand. He presented and brought truth. He came to bring truth. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus brought truth. It came from Christ. Number two, truth brings light. John 3.21, when you get truth, you, your darkness must flee. When you get truth, it illuminates the situation. 
If we could shine the light of truth on deceit and lies and darkness, then that's what God wants us to do. I spend most of my time listening to people to see what lie they done accepted, what arena of darkness are they living in, so I can shine the truth of light upon it. I'm not the smartest fella. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm not the fastest car on the track. But one thing I have learned to do is I've learned God's truth, and when I listen to people with their drama and their pain, I'm listening for lies that they've embraced, untruths and darkness by which they have governed their lives, and I try to shine the light of truth on it. My whole job is to try to get y'all to believe truth. That's my whole job, trying to get y'all to believe truth. Trying to get you to believe you were not born to be a homosexual. You were not born to sleep with women and you or sleep with thousands of women. Amen. Or men. Ladies. All the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. You weren't born to give it up to every person to find out who's supposed to be your life partner. You ain't got to do that. I know you're getting old, but thank God that you're getting old. I think I told the church Sunday night, ladies, you want, how can nobody want to marry you? You giving up the milk for free. I don't know any store you can go into. You can't go into the 7-Eleven Giant Safeway. Go over to the milk section. Grab a cart and break it over. Take a swig. I don't want it. Put it, close it back up and put it back on the shelf. You, you don't do it. It don't work like that. And you are much more valuable than a carton of milk. All the single ladies, all the single ladies. Come on, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. I'm trying to shine light on your darkness. You don't need, to, you don't need a person to be whole. John 8, 32, truth makes you free. Now that's, that's, that, that's a powerful passage right there. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and it says, that, and the truth shall make you free. I love that passage. The truth makes you free. Some people say it sets you free. No, no, he makes you free. And the operative word here is make. It's a creation of God. He creates freedom in you, hallelujah. You may have been bound all your life, but when you come into exposure with the truth, it makes you free. God creates freedom for you so you can live and thrive in freedom. The truth shall make you free. Somebody holler amen. It makes you free. John 8, 44. Satan has no truth. Now, this is a revelatory a revelation too. John 8, 44. The devil has... I want to read that. I want y'all to turn to John 8, 44 real quick. I want you to read this passage. John 8, 44, man, time is going by, it's quarter to eight already. Look at verse, here's what it says. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. He does not stand in the truth, why? Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The devil is a liar and there is, I like this, no truth in him. Nothing he says got any truth in it. But y'all, some folk listen to the devil. That's why they get frustrated. They listen to what the devil tells them. He has no truth. Somebody say no truth. No truth. John 14, 17. Let me, let me read that to you. That's a powerful passage. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive 
because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Here's the truth. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Let me tell y'all something. When you get truth, don't go to your girlfriend and expect her to understand it and embrace it. Part of the problem is y'all are frustrated because you're talking to unsaved people and you get, they don't understand it and they don't see it. You get frustrated and y'all have to stop expecting unsaved people to see truth. You can't see the things of God till God opens your eyes to see truth. Don't expect people to understand you going the second mile of the way. Don't expect people to understand somebody smack you on one cheek and you turn the other cheek. Don't expect the world to understand your spouse done, done messed up and you take them back. Don't expect the world to understand you giving your money to the kingdom of God. Don't expect the world to understand those kinds of things. They're not going to understand it. And they're going to counsel you the opposite of God. I keep telling people all the time, if I want to figure out how God wants something done, let me figure out how I would do it, then go 180 degrees, and that's probably God's way of doing it. Because he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. As far as the east is from the west, so are my ways from your ways. God don't think like you with your jacked up self. Go ahead, look at your neighbor. Say, he don't think like you with your jacked up self. Look at the person on the side. Say, you just as crazy as you can be. You know God don't think like you. You crazy, you jacked up, you slow, you, you messed up. The world will not receive truth. Why are you shocked and surprised? And some of y'all let these people talk you right out of truth. And call you names and you, you start second guessing yourself. My strength is I've learned to forget about what people say. That's what I thank God for. I, I thank God that I've learned how to forget about what people gotta say. Say what they wanna say, they can't deliver me, I have found consol consolence, I found strength, I found deliverance, I found hope. Y'all not even listening to me, are y'all? I can't let y'all take a sneak preview because y'all don't listen to me no more. John 16, 13. Here's what I like. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. The spirit of God guides us into all truth. He will lead you. He will bring you into the revelation of it. It comes from God. He'll put you in circumstances where you hear what you need to hear. And I, you know what I think about God? It, there's truth that God has given me today that I couldn't have handled 20 years ago. So he, he, he brings me into the knowledge of it when he knows I'm ready to receive it. He guides me to what I need to hear that's going to help me for what I have to face in my life today. Hallelujah. I praise the Lord for that. I thank God for the spirit of truth who guides us into all truth. Amen. If you pursue him, seek him, he'll bring you right into all truth. 17, 17. I like this, John. All these verses are in, not all of them. I got a couple that are not in John, or one or two that are not in John, but... 1717 says, here's a powerful passage too. He says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. When you get the word in you, you get truth in you, it clean, it cleans, cleans, it, it washes you up. It cleans you up. People want to know, how do I get victory over this habit? That's addiction. You ain't in the word. That's why you keep on falling. That's why you're still struggling the same stuff five, 10, 15 years, because you haven't embraced truth. Any stronghold that the enemy has in your life is rooted and grounded in a lack of truth. Once you get the truth in you, the truth, that's what John 17, 17 says, the truth will sanctify you. And the word sanctification means he cleans you up. Now, what we have learned to do is how to look clean. See, the saints know how to look clean. It's not that they are clean, but they look clean. 
they look saved and sanctified and Holy Ghost filled, but but once you get them behind closed doors, once they get away from church, once they get at home, once they get out of the sight of the pastor, them jokers will break it on down. <laughs> but when you get sanctified, it doesn't matter who you're around because you know that God has cleaned you up. I don't know if anybody, listen, let me be honest with y'all. There are some things that God has cleaned up in my life that I thought I would never get the victory from. Go ahead, look straight ahead. Act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about because you ain't experienced it. You ain't tasted it. But I'm here to preach and declare to you that I don't care what your issue are, is, what your habits are, what your secrets are, what you in bondage to. We serve a God that when you get the washed in the word of the water of God's word, he will free you. He'll take the taste away. He'll take the desire away. He'll take the power away so you can live a righteous life. But you got to get underneath the washing of the water of the word. You got to get that water of the word poured on you every day. You got to get the word washed over you. You got to get truth in you. You keep listening to lies. The devil done told you he the only one that love you. That's why you keep up being, ending up in the bed with him because you don't believe nobody else will ever love you. But when you get truth in you and understand whose you are and who you are, when you learn that you are more than a conqueror, when you learn that God says, I have a plan and a future for your life. And it is not dependent on that joker being in your life. Matter of fact, he or she is a hindrance to your destiny. And as soon as you get that in your mind and get washed in that, you won't keep going back to that thing. I love that. The truth sanctifies you and cleans, cleans, cleanses you up. If you are not get listen, if you've been in the church five years and you still struggling in the same areas that you were five years ago, you're not being sanctified by the word. You still struggling in the same issues ten years you had ten years ago. You're not getting sanctified by the word. There's not a problem with the power of God. The problem is with you. Amen. That was a powerful thing I just said. Y'all should have been jumping and shouting saying that's true. When Oprah, when Oprah River gave away those cars, she said, and you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. And the people shouted, they shouted and danced. And I just gave a revelation much better than the car. You the problem, you the problem, you the problem. Yes, Lord. We're not free because we're not allowing the word to sanctify. Anybody who's can, still in the same issues, still struggling, no freedom, no growth, I can show you a person that's not being sanctified by the word. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Tells us that when you obey the word, you obey the truth that you hear, it purifies you. 1 Peter 1.22, it says, since you have purified your souls, how do you purify your souls? In obeying the truth. Get the truth and obey it. God purifies you. There it is. That's how we get the breakthrough. That's how we win. 
When you get that happening in your life, it don't matter what weapons the devil aims at you. It doesn't matter what he brings in your life. He can't win. All right, let's dive into these seven principles real quick. Seven principles of truth. That's what they are. Seven principles of truth. I want to hit very quickly. Number one is design and purpose. Design and purpose. God created you. God designed you. You have a purpose in life. You're not an accident. You're not a coincidence. You're not just a happen chance of something happening between your mom and daddy in the back of a 57 Chevy. God knew about you before the foundations of the world. Before the world was created, God knew about you and he designed everything about you. So you, you need to stop trying to change who you are, what you look like, change the color of your eyes, trying to get surgeries and all of that. Just thank God for how he made you. He made you the way you are. Amen. Learn to thank and praise him. Psalm 130. 139 says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Matter of fact, let's turn there real quick. Psalm 139. It's again one of those life-changing passages for me in my life. Verse 14, I will praise you. Let me start at verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. See, when you were in your mother's womb, God had covered you. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and I like this, and that my soul knows very well. There's the breakthrough when your soul knows, when your mind, will, and emotion knows that everything about you, God created about you. He made you just the way you are. And guess what? He created everything that is, that's a part of you. Your family, your mama, your daddy, your history, everything about you. He allowed it all to happen in your life. Why? So you would be who he created you to be. So you can be the person he wants you to be to accomplish his purposes. You cannot be who God has called you to be and do what he's called you to do without who your mom and daddy is, who your relative is, who your brother is who gets on your last nerves, who your sick sister is, who your grandmama is. You couldn't be who you are had they not been in your family. I know you say, but my family is dysfunctional. Can I tell you something? I have yet to meet an undysfunctional family. Everybody's family got some dysfunction in it. with everybody's family your family ain't unique I know you feel like your family is the Adams family but there's plenty of Adams families on the street they just been able to dress it up and cover it up but if you go and live with them for a few days you say oh my god what is happening in this family Everybody got dysfunctions. So everything, and, you're, and the thing that's powerful about this patch is, he says, and that my soul knows very well. Y'all need to stop trying to jump out of your families and leave your families. Divorce your families. For you to be who God created you to be, the answer is not to leave the family and go start another family. That ain't the answer. Let me tell y'all something. Let me tell you a thing or two. You can be in a marriage and your wife getting on your nerves, your husband just got you flipped out and crazy, and you say, I'm tired of this, I'm gonna get somebody else, and you don't like them no more, you're not attracted to them no more, you don't want them no more, and they don't want you no more, and y'all just wanna go your separate ways. Then you go and find somebody else. I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen. The new person you find is going to become just like the person you just left. And here's what you're going to say, but they weren't like that before we got married. Yeah, and the common element to all the situation is you. You the problem. I told y'all, you the problem. You the problem. How many marriages are you going to have to go through before you realize you're the issue? I 
I know you keep saying, all three of my spouses were crazy. <laughs> well, what does that say about you? You chose to marry all three of them. What does that say about you? Everything about our lives, God shapes and permits to make us. Y'all got to get this truth. I'm trying to help y'all get it. Somebody said, what if I married the wrong person? Let me tell you something. Come here, Deacon uh, Lena. Come here, Sister Lena. How long y'all been married? 26. 26 years. Does she ever get on your nerves? She do? Yeah. Y'all see how slow he was in answering that question? Is he ever, did he ever get on your nerves? Yes, Pastor. Yeah, she said it loud with authority, quick, fast. So they've been married 26 years. I can guarantee, I don't know nothing about their history. I ain't never been with them. I can, I can guarantee they've been married 26 years. I know they done had some times when she got on his last nerves, strumming them, playing them. <laughs> he got on her last nerves. They got on each other's last nerves. I know that during the course of their marriage, there, there have been times I know when they wanted to go separate ways. Absolutely. Abs she said absolutely. <laughs> Now, here's what I want to show you. When you get married, let's just, just for the sake of our discussion. I'm not saying this fact, just for the sake of our discussion. Let's just say this was not the person that God had for them, for him to marry, and he was not the person for her to marry. Let's just, just for the sake of our discussion. So they not, they not, they just, they, they just, you know, they not, they not married, and God had, um, uh, let me see. Out. Raymond, come on over here. <laughs> no. no, here's the deal. No, no, stay there. I'm just, I was a joke. So let's, let's just say there was somebody else. But now they get married. They, they come and whatever attracted them to each other, they got married. They entered into an institution. That now that they're married, this becomes the life partner and nobody else is an option anymore because they've entered into an institution. When you get married, y'all listen to me, you enter into an institution that God created. That's what makes you married. So they, 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 are, they have become, this is God's will for their life. It is not God's will for him to get rid of her and go someplace Amen. else. That's a lie from the devil. So, so all of the experiences of her getting on his nerves and him getting on her nerves were designed and allowed by God so that when they got to this stage of their marriage, they could say to you jokers thinking about getting married and thinking about divorce, that, what did y'all say to me when y'all first came up here? What did y'all say? We made that decision that divorce is not an option. Did y'all hear that? Divorce is not an option. No matter what happens. Huh? No matter what happens. Say it again. No matter what happens. No matter what happens. It, so that they can stand here confidently and boldly and tell you, divorce is not an option. Look at him, he's such a good man. <laughs> Everything about life, God designed it. He has a purpose behind every pain and every situation. If he allowed it in your life, he gonna bring something good out of it, Romans 8, 28.
Y'all get them thoughts out of your mind, nigga. Those lies. You have a design and a purpose. Number two, authority. Here's something we don't want to talk about. Everybody is called to be submitted to somebody's authority. Everybody. Here's a lie the devil tells you. You ain't got to listen to nobody. You ain't got to do what he tells you to do. He put his pants on one leg at a time just like you. I don't know who he think he is telling me this. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm my own man. Hebrews 13, 7 and 17, 13, 17 gives clarity that everybody is to be submitted to authority. This is a principle taught throughout, throughout Scripture and modeled throughout Scripture. Some of you, when you buck up against your authorities, you are bucking up against God. Can I say that again? Yes. What did I just say? Y'all not listen. Let me wait. Y'all not listen. Let me wait. Just wait. Let me wait. Y'all finish right. Let me just wait. Y'all finish right. I want y'all to get this. This is how the devil messes up a lot of people's lives. He gets you bucking against authority. Your parents try to tell you to do something you don't want to do what your parents tell you to do. My oldest daughter got a basketball scholarship to the University of Maryland. A basketball scholarship means a full ride. Hey, glory, thank you. But she also got a full ride to Georgetown University. She got two scholarships. Her mom and daddy wanted her to go to Georgetown, but she decided she wanted to go to Maryland because it was a parte place. She visited Georgetown. She said, all those kids walk around us with books. <laughs> she went to Maryland. She decided to go to Maryland. And at the end of the first year on the basketball team, she was horrified. She could not get out of Maryland fast enough. The school that she was so enthralled with. And God was gracious. She repented. And the day she got released from Maryland, Georgetown said, we'll give her another four-year ride. <laughs> Somebody say, that's favor. Because that ain't how it goes. I mean, when you missed you miss the ride, you missed it. God gave her another chance. I say that because some of y'all done missed the mark, but if you repent, God will give you another chance. So if you ask her today, she'll tell you, I'm going to listen to my mom and daddy. That's the lesson. God, matter of fact, there's four God-given authorities, four primary authorities. Number one is family. You're called to be submitted to the structure of authority of family. Again, a bunch of scriptures here. Ephesians 5, 1 Peter 3, Ephesians 6. 1 Peter 3, 1, that's a powerful passage right there, powerful. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. God's all in that passage right there. That's just the, the Holy Ghost is just oozing out the corners of that verse right there. Hey, ta ta ta. Oh, Shanda Baka. Hey. Glory. <laughs> Woo. Oh, glory. It's a structure of family. When people come and ask me, Again, y'all, I know some of you heard me talk about this before. I got to keep driving it home. When people want to know, Pastor, what do you think about this? My, one of my first questions will be, is have you talked to your parents about it? How has God inclined their heart? Now, when you're grown, you don't, have to, you don't have to be obedient to your parents. In Ephesians 6, it says children obey. So when you are a child, you have to obey. But when you become an adult, you honor your parents. You obey and honor are two different things. When you're a child, you obey. You just do what you tell, they tell you to do. Honor your parents means you give weight to what they say. You believe heavily that God might use them to give some inclination about the direction you should go. You're not called to obey. You're called to give honor to what they share with you. So the structure of family. 
And so if an authority asks you to do something that's unscriptural, you make an appeal. That's a whole other discussion. I don't have time to talk about that tonight. But if they ask you to do something illegal or unscriptural, you make an appeal. I'm not telling you to blindly follow anybody in any structure of authority. But as long as it's not illegal or immoral, you do everything in your power to honor the wishes and believe that God, Proverbs 21 and 1, God controls the heart of the person in authority. So family is one, the, your employer. Number two, your boss, where you work. You can keep on mouthing off at your boss if you want to. But there's hundreds of thousands of people who will take your job in a minute. I know you think that you are invaluable to your job. I did in the fire you and I bet you the company will keep on rolling. They'll find somebody to take your place. So 1 Peter 2, Ephesians 6, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 2. Again, repeat it over and over again. Be submitted to the authorities and to your boss. Number three is the government. Listen to and submit to the, the, the laws of the land. Again, as long as the laws are not immoral, unscriptural, we have to submit to the laws of the land. God uses government to give direction. And number four is the church. The structure and authority of the local church. Everybody should be submitted to a local church. All you jokers that don't belong to a church, you outside of the will of God, because it means you're not submitted to anybody. We got a lot of people who come to our church that don't belong. I don't know what the issue is. I can't figure out why they don't join. Some of y'all took years to join. Y'all came for years. Left yourself uncovered, unsubmitted. When you join the church, you bring yourself under the, uh, under the umbrella of the favor that God has resting on that church. <laughs> belong to some church. Be submitted somewhere other than Bedside Baptist. Come on, talk to me for a second. <laughs> and be submitted. Be submitted. Being a part, don't just have your name on the roll. Do what's asked of you. That's what submission means. I'm doing what's been asked of me to do. That's significant and important. Do I have an amen anywhere in the camp? Again, the devil will tell you that you don't have to listen. That's spiritual warfare. He will try to convince you you don't have to listen to what they say. And as long as they're not telling you to do something immoral or unscriptural or illegal, you should submit to what they ask you to do. It's best within your power. Believe God can use them to give direction for your life. Y'all got all of that? Principle number three, responsibility. Everybody must understand a truth. The truth is, I have to give an account for what I do. I can't blame it on the fact that I don't know my father. He wasn't in my life. I can't blame it. Now, my wife didn't give me none, so I went out and got it with somebody else. You can't, you have to take responsibility for your own choices you have to each of us have to give an account to God for our own actions the lie from the devil is you're not responsible that's something he whispers in your ears got you believing go ahead and get drunk you unhappy God won't mind you have justifiable reason for going out and doing what you do that's a lie from the devil everybody here must give an account to God for what you say and what you do the words that come out of your mouth and the actions that you participate in, you will have to answer to God for. Number four, ownership. You don't own anything, everything belongs to God. The moment you learn that you don't own anything, you won't get upset if somebody messes up something that, that you think you own. Everything you have belongs to God. Psalm 24 and 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Everything belongs to God. 1 Corinthians 6 talks about your temple belongs to God. You don't own it yourself, it belongs to him. This is, a, this is again one of those critical revelations that you got to understand. The moment you can yield and give everything away to God and say, it's his, I'm not going to be upset 
that belongs to you, God, is yours. It's going to take a whole lot of stress off a whole lot of y'all who are stressed out because you're worried about stuff. Every possession you have can be replaced. You can get another house, you can get another car, you can get some more clothes. You can all been out of shape. Somebody scratch your car. You ballistic out in the parking lot screaming, hollering, because somebody scratched your car. That's crazy. Blood pressure up. Because somebody that hit your car, scratch your car, you mad. Yeah, I mean, just take it to the shop, get it fixed. No big deal. Ain't no, hey, it is what it is. Everything you have belongs to God. Ownership, very key, very important. Number, number five, suffering. Here's the thing that we don't want to talk about, but the truth is we will have seasons of suffering. What did the devil tell you? God don't want you to suffer. That's the devil. Here's what I hear people say. God don't want me to be unhappy. Eh, wrong answer. He's not after your happiness. He's after your conformity. He's after shaping you into the image of what he wants you to be. So we're going to have seasons of suffering, y'all. There will be seasons of suffering. You know, one pastor says, if you don't suffer with him, you can't reign with him. The devil came and tempted Jesus for a season, then departed for a season. Came and tempted him, then he departed for a season. You're going to have seasons of suffering. Don't be surprised. First Peter 4 says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to befall you. Don't get shocked or disappointed because you're going through some stuff. It's a, way, it's a pattern of life. It's how God shapes us and makes us. Again, the devil's whispering in your ear that, that this ain't God. You, you're not supposed to suffer. It's a lie from hell to make people think you're just supposed to be happy all the time. That's not true. You got to have rain. It rains on the just as well as the unjust. So when it rains, how are you going to handle it? You can't appreciate the sun until you have some rain in your life sometimes. God uses, God uses rain to help you appreciate the sunshine but he uses seasons of suffering to mature you and help you become help you become seasoned help you endure times and periods of your life so if you never had a problem you would never know that God could solve it if you never had to go through anything you would never know that God could bring you through I can handle stuff now because I've had some stuff in my past so I can go through it now because, hey, that's light compared to what I, God done prepared me for this. I can handle, I can take a lick and then keep on ticking. Because I done already been through something. So there are, there are going to be seasons of suffering. Number six is freedom. God provides true freedom. What's the point of that? Here's the point of that, is that the devil wants you to think you can never be free. That's the lie from the devil. That's him whispering in your ear. You ain't going to never break free from this. You ain't going to never get deliverance from this. You're going to have this issue all your life. That's a lie. John 8, 36, God wants, matter of fact, the scripture teaches us that God is going to create freedom in you, make freedom in you. And what I love about the promises of God is that when he gives us freedom, it is true freedom and it is lasting freedom. It, it will endure. It will take you through the storm. The sun will make you free indeed is what John 8, 36. The sun will make you free, show sure enough, for real free. Not perpetrating free, not acting like you free, because you know church folk know how to put on a, a facade like they got it together. Then they go home and cry like they don't have it together. But when you get, when you really get to understand who you are in the Lord and get that word washed in your life, God creates true freedom in you. Amen. Look back over my life and I thank God for the things He brought me out of that I thought I would never get out of. Success, number seven. Seven truth is success. 
God does bring success. What is, how do you measure success? Is it determined by the amount of money that you make? The size of your house, the kind of car you drive? Success is determined when you are doing and being what God has called you to do and be. When I am walking in what God created me to walk in and fulfilling God's assignment for my life, that's true success. I'm doing what God created me to do. I love the song that Stephen wrote and sings, Stephen heard, called Destiny. He says, I know what I'm here for. <laughs> and God created Diane just to be an amen for Pastor Jenkins. That's her creation. That's why God created her right there. I'm praying he raises up some more Diane for me. Everybody here, God has something he created you for. You have a design and purpose, and when you walk in it, you'll be successful. I know I'm going to go a little long tonight. Let me hit these once again. Design and purpose, authority, responsibility, ownership, suffering, freedom, and success. Those are the seven parts of this belt of truth I like to call that God has called us to put on to carry it everything else attaches to that belt everything in life will be will hinge off of one of these truths I guarantee you the lies that the devil tells you will be centered around one of these principles that he wants to violate or some lie that's, that's contrary to what this teaches all right, let's get the second piece of armor. I got time. Let's talk about the breastplate of righteousness. Can I talk about that for a few minutes? I just got three or four slides on this. The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate covers the most important part of the body where the vital organs reside. That's what the breastplate covers. Where the critical organs are. The heart in particular. Righteousness means to be in right standing with God. That's what the word righteousness means. God puts me in right standing with him. I want to be in right standing with God. And, and I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 8, because it's going to give us some insight into what that breastplate looks like. How do we be in right standing with God? How do we be right with God? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate, here it is, of faith and love. Those are the two components that are necessary to be in right standing with God, faith and love. It has to do with our posture toward God and our posture toward people. It's a twofold thing. You want to be in right standing with God, you got to have faith toward God, and you got to be, you have to have love toward people. It's a twofold piece. And so the, the text is saying, put on the breastplate to protect your faith, protect, protect your ability to believe God, and to protect your ability in your relationships with other people. Now here's what the devil wants to do. The devil wants to lie to you, and the devil wants to shoot darts at you, and the devil wants you to doubt God. He wants you to think that God can't bring you out. He cannot fix the situation. He cannot turn it around. He won't answer your prayers. He doesn't care about you. He wants to speak all these lies and these deceits and cause you to doubt God. And when the devil gets you doubting God, he has breached your breastplate of righteousness. 
Faith is the ability to trust God and know that he will deliver. Here's what you got to do. You got to get in a situation and believe deep in your heart. I don't care how ugly the situation gets. I don't care how painful it is. I don't care how much it looks like it's not going to turn around. But I believe that somehow, someway, the God that I serve is going to somehow bring me through this situation. That's faith. Come hell or high water, he's a way maker. Come hell or high water, he will bring me out. One way or the other, he is going to bring me out. Hallelujah. We got to believe God. Somebody say, believe God. Believe God. Say it like, say, believe God. Believe God. We have to believe God. Faith is the ability to trust and know he will deliver. That's faith. Matter of fact, Romans 4 says that faith was accounted to Abraham and it made him righteous. Because Abraham dared believe God, the scripture says because he believed, it made him righteous. Read that when you get an opportunity. That's an incredible passage. It said, God says, because this man dared believe me, God says, it automatically put him in right standing with me. Woo, that's awesome, y'all. It wasn't based on what he did. It wasn't based on doing, him doing seven Hail Marys. It wasn't based on how much money he gave. It wasn't based on him bowing down in a certain direction. It was based on the fact that he dared to believe God. And if you would just believe God for your life, it would put you in right standing with him. It was accounted to righteousness for him. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, you can't even please God. You question and doubting God without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please the God that we serve. Without faith, it's impossible. I could spend a whole section talking just about believing God. Whatever you need to do to build up your faith, whatever causes you to doubt God, get rid of it. Whatever causes you to question the existence and the power of God, rebuke it. But live your life in faith, believing. Some, they can't mention this. Do y'all have enough history to know that God exists? Can you look back over your life and see that he's done some things for you to trust him? So, so why would you doubt him now? Why would, you, why would you think that God would bring you all the way up to this point and then abandon you. Why, why would he be a God to bring you through all the drama you've been through, through all of your life, to bring you to this point right here and then walk away and leave you? That's not the kind of God that we serve. That's not the kind of Savior he is. That's not the kind of Savior he is. He said, Lo, I will be with you always. Faith and secondly is love. That's part two, love. Love is a deep and constant benevolence. That word love is agape, A-G-A-P-E. It's a Greek word, agape. It means, it means benevolent, deep, constant, consistent, committed love. In the human language, we use the one word love to describe a lot of things. In the Greek, they had a whole lot of different, they had five different levels of love. Let me give you three. One is called eros, E-R-O-S, erotic, selfish. What can you do for me? It is a what can you do for me love. Then there's one called phileo. That's, that's another level, phileo. P-H-I-L-E-O, phileo. What does that mean? It means for friendship. B mutual, beneficial. You do for me, I'm going to do for you. You scratch my back, I'm going to scratch yours. You call me, I'll call you back. You buy me a Christmas gift, I'm going to buy you one. I pay $29.95 for yours, by the way. <laughs> Agape love is a love that gives with no hopes of anything in return. It's benevolent. I'm giving because I care for you. I'm giving because I want the best for you. I'm giving because I want you to succeed. I'm giving because I, I want you to win. 
And I give you thousands of scriptures that challenges us in this arena. John 13, 35 says, By this shall men know that you are my disciples, because you have loved one to another. Amen. The sign that you are a child of God, according to Jesus in John 13, 35, is that we show love one to another. Amen. Agape love. We are showing and demonstrating and caring for. And Jesus said, it is, this is the sign. This is what tells whether a person really has a genuine walk with God, the ability to love. Amen. I... <laughs> I want y'all to turn to 1 John 3, then I'm gonna be finished, almost. Because I wanna read this verse 10 through 19, because it speaks for itself. It, it, matter of fact, it probably requires no explanation. 1 John chapter three. Listen to this, I want y'all to listen to this. 1 John chapter three, verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Here's how you can tell the difference between a person who knows God and a person who's under control of the devil. That's what verse 10 says. Y'all see that? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not has Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder his brother? Why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have, we know, verse 14, we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. I mean, that's, is that crystal clear or is it crystal clear? Y'all are quiet. Y'all must got conviction. I feel, I sense conviction rolling around the building. That's how we know. And that's the kind of church, that's the kind of family we ought to be. We ought to be caring for each other, loving each other, supporting each other, praying for each other, giving out of our resources to help each other. That's the kind of church we should be. That's the kind of family we ought to be. That's my sister, that's my brother. Their family's in need. And I got it, I'm gonna help them out. God gave you a new car so you could swing around and pick somebody up and bring them to church. God gave you a big house so you could let somebody live in the room and sleep in the room and I had that old big empty house all by yourself. You know why God blesses me with so much? Because he knows I don't mind giving and sharing with other people. I can't help myself. It's the love that's in me. Amen. I could be a rich man by now, but I just keep on giving my money away. But I am rich, not in money, but I'm rich in the things of God. Look at chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. I know I'm going late, y'all. Let's hang, bang with me for two more minutes. Verse 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. If you've got hatred in your heart toward anybody, you better re-examine where you stand with God. Do whatever you have to do to guard your heart and protect yourself from losing faith and protect your heart from allowing hatred to enter into your heart. You know how I do that? If somebody do something that bothers me, irritates me, makes me angry, I deal with it that day. Because I know if I let it sit in there, it's going to lay an egg, have some babies, 
It's going to breed something and something's going to birth in me that's going to be a little difficult to get out. Amen. Some of you mess up and the devil wins because somebody do something, it hurts you, it bothers you. You don't want to say nothing. You don't want to, you don't want to ruffle nobody's feathers. You don't want nobody to, you're just going you're just gonna to think you're going to sleep on it. Before you know it, the devil didn't lie some in your heart and now you're angry and mad, upset. Now you don't want to be around the person. You don't want to talk to them. You're avoiding their calls. You have now breached the ability to be in right standing with God. Put the breastplate up. Say, let me deal with this tonight. I need to call you. You know what? You know when you said that so-and-so? I need to tell you, that hurt me deeply. I'm going to forgive you. Punch you in your face when I see you, but I forgive you. <laughs> I'm gonna repent after I hit you, but I just want you to know. Y'all know I'm joking. Y'all do know I'm joking. I want you to examine yourself in these two areas. I'm not gonna take no questions tonight because I'm way over time. I want to get into prayer tonight. I'm not gonna take any answer questions. But here's what I want you to do. Some of you are missing out on God and being in right standing with him because you got bruised relationships. I want to challenge you to go and make them right. Amen. That's how the devil wins. If he gets a foot in your door, are y'all listening to me? Put your papers down. Just can put it down for a minute. Can I just minister to you for a minute? Y'all offending me right now. Let me tell you how I feel about what y'all doing right now. I want to minister to you for a minute because I know a lot of people in church are missing out on what God has for them, the riches of the blessings of Christ because you got bruised and broken relationships. Somebody hurt you, you expected more from them. Why, why, why you expect righteousness from unrighteous people? Is your anger and pain toward that person worth you missing out on the riches of everything that God has for you? Y'all hear me? Let's pray. Take a moment and ask God, are there any people, God, that I need to get right with? Any bruised and broken relationships that I need to go and make right? Ask God to give you the courage to win this spiritual battle. The devil knew that it would mess up your walk with God if he brought the person in your life that said something and did something that would just flick you off. And they're lost in your heart is that animosity and that hatred toward that person. You're missing out on everything that God has for you. It's time to get it right. They don't need to acknowledge it. You just need to forgive them. You need to say, you know what? I've harbored this against you. Please forgive me. And ask God to forgive you and ask them to forgive you. And I guarantee you all, listen to me, I guarantee you, if you make this step toward God, watch him begin to give you victories in areas of your life that you never thought you would ever have. Father, in Jesus' name, we want to put on the full arm of God. We want to be able to win and not lose, be victorious and not be defeated. I want to pray now, God, in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you help us to be everything you want us to be. Fill our hate-filled hearts with your love. Let our faith be ignited to believe you for the impossible. Help us to know that we can trust you with our lives, trust you with everything. Help us to put on the belt of truth and the breast, breastplate of righteousness in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray that if the person is unsaved, backslidden, unsure, that you would draw them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Help me give God a shout for that tonight.
We hope that you have been blessed by this message from Pastor Jenkins. If you're unsaved or have fallen away from your relationship with Jesus Christ, you just have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart on, right now that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again with all power. Your sins are now forgiven, and you're part of the family of God. Welcome. Maybe you're already saved and in need of a church home, one that will nurture your growth and development as a Christian. Or perhaps you were once in fellowship with God, but have since drifted away and are ready to return to your first love. Whatever the case, we'd love to have you become a part of the First Baptist family. Simply contact us at 301-773-3600 or visit our website at www.fbcglenarden.org for information on any of our convenient services or 100 plus ministries designed to meet your most intimate needs. Pastor John K. Jenkins Sr., First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. We are developing dynamic disciples.